This is the second study in the series on Bible psychology, spirit and soul. We are following the outline which has been provided. Briefly, I will recapitulate what some of the ground that we covered yesterday and then move on from there. I pointed out to you yesterday that I believe there are three things man can only know by divine revelation. That is the revelation of the scripture. If man does not have divine revelation, he cannot find out these three things. That is the nature of God, the origin of man, and man's own inner nature. Man is a mystery to himself until the light of Scripture by the Holy Spirit is shone upon his inner nature. And I think you will agree from our study yesterday that man's inner nature is closely related to his origin. He cannot understand his inner nature if he does not know his own origin because of all the creatures in the universe, man has an absolutely unique origin. No other creature in the universe, as I understand it, was brought into being in the way that man was brought into being. Um, turning to your outline and just glancing through it, we see that total man consists of spirit, soul, and body. We are thus presented with the picture of a triune man, three and yet one, created in the likeness of a triune God, a God who is three and yet one. And we looked at the actual account of this creative act of God in Genesis 2, 7. We saw the Spirit of God inbreathed from above, the clay molded from beneath, the union of that which comes from above, which is spirit, that which is from beneath, which is clay or flesh or body, producing a living soul, an individual personality, someone who can say, I will or I will not, someone who is uniquely responsible for his own action. That's what a living soul is. Probably there are no more important words than you can ever utter than those words, I will or I will not. And there is something in you that is answerable for that and you cannot shift that responsibility onto anything or anybody else. That's what it means to have a soul, to be an individual, to have to make decisions. And we saw that because of this background of man, there is the built-in possibility of inner turmoil and conflict. There's something in him from above, something in him from beneath. And there's always the possibility of the tension. Some part of him wanting to relate upwards, some part of him pulling downwards. And I think every human being that's walked the face of the earth from Adam onwards has experienced this tension. If you study the writings of poets and philosophers, a great deal of their speculation is devoted to trying to account for this inner struggle that goes on within man. The great philosopher Plato had his picture of the soul's chariot with two horses, the white horse that was always seeking to go upwards, the black horse that was always pulling the chariot downwards. That was just a pictorial way of presenting this conflict. Then we noticed the nature of spirit, that it is the continuing, originating, outgoing breath of the Almighty. Elsewhere in Scripture, the Spirit of God is called the breath of the Almighty. God originates everything. Of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. God never received first and paid back. God is the originator and giver of all things. Spirit goes forth, but soul is initially the recipient. Soul breathes in before it can breathe out. You remember the two Hebrew words, ruach, spirit, the steady outgoing breath, nefesh, the in-breathing before the out-breathing. So there we see in the very words the fact 
And uh, Jesus said, uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, about the first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, was made a life-giving spirit. Notice the three contrasts between first and last, between soul and spirit, between living and life-giving. Spirit is life-giving. Soul becomes living through the life-giving spirit. Then we just looked briefly at the Greek words uh, for spirit, pneuma, about the only common English word that we get from pneuma is pneumatic, which used to be a distinctive word to describe tires that were filled with air, but of course all tires being filled with air now, we don't use the word very much. Pneuma means spirit or wind or breath. Sometimes there's a kind of play on the double meanings, as in John 3, where Jesus said, the wind bloweth where it listeth, or the spirit breathes where he will. It can mean either just as much the one as the other. Soul, psyche. Now, I don't want to overdo this, but even in the Greek language, you have the sound in the word. Pneuma, a steady outgoing breath. But psyche begins with an ingoing breath. Suche. Can you see that? Suche. So right built-in language is this basic distinction between spirit, which is originating, outgoing, continuing, soul, which must receive in before it can give forth. And I, I venture to suggest to you that if this is new to you, if you meditate on it and turn it over in your mind, it will become more and more real and more and more illuminating to you as you meditate in it. And the Greek word for body is soma. So we have spirit, pneuma, soul, psyche, or psuche, and body, soma. Now, as we're going to see this morning, unregenerate man knows nothing of, of the spirit. In most cases, he's not even aware that there is such a thing as a spirit. And it's very interesting that in the language of the world, you find no words built up out of pneuma. But when you get to the word psyche, the soul, you get many, many words that begin with psycho. Because man is very conscious of the realm of the soul, but ignorant of the realm of the spirit. So you have words like psychiatry or psychology, psychic, and all these are accurate. They relate to the realm of the soul. Very, very important for Christians to understand that psychiatry and psychology are in the soulish realm. It's, they're legitimate within their limits, but they are limited to the soul realm. The word psychic, which refers nowadays to supernatural manifestations of satanic origin, also very significant because they play on the soul, not on the spirit, as we'll see later. So now we're going on in the outline with the material that's new for today. Talk for a moment about the location of spirit and soul within human personality. The spirit is located in an area deep within man somewhere I suppose medically below the diaphragm and above the pelvis there is a kind of hollow area uh, in John 7:38, which we'll look at a little later Jesus said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water and he says the writer of the gospel says he was speaking of the spirit. It's very specific, out of the belly. Now the Greek word, koilia, means that which is hollow. And the same word is used to describe the concave arch of heaven. So, <laughs> there's something heaven-shaped 
inside man, within his physical body, that is the area of the spirit. The King James Version in John 7.38 says belly, and I like to stick to belly, because I want you to know that it's out of your physical body. When we get so spiritual we have to say inner being, that leaves us all vague and theological and really doesn't relate it to anything. See, actually, when you get upset and nervous and you've got an important interview or a driving test, you tell people you have butterflies where? <laughs> In your stomach. That's right. And that's exactly where it is. And almost everything that really matters in your experience starts there. That's the area that you've got to guard most carefully of all the areas of your personality. Let's turn to Job 32 and see some clear statements made there. Job 32, just verse 8. And then we look at two verses further down in the chapter. Job 32, 8. But there is a spirit in man. See, that's a very, very important statement. There is a spirit in man. Now, I was a philosopher and a professor of philosophy and all the rest of it. For many years, I didn't know that. I knew I had a soul. I knew I had a body. I was absolutely unaware of the existence of a spirit. The Bible reveals this. There is a spirit in man. It's something you need to know. And the inspiration or the inbreathed breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. The inspiration of the Almighty refers to the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God operates in man on the Spirit of man. And through the contact between God's Spirit and man's Spirit comes understanding. In the Scripture, understanding is almost always spiritual. It is not soulish. It isn't mental ability. It's something quite different. So here we're told three very important facts that verse there is a spirit in man on the man, spirit of man the spirit of God acts and through the interaction of God's spirit and man's spirit there comes that which is called understanding understanding is not education lots of highly educated people have no understanding at all you know the people who are creating the biggest problems in the world today the educated fools you could there's no doubt about that I think it was one of your presidents I think it was Theodore Roosevelt Roosevelt who said, if a man is uneducated, he'll steal a railroad car. But if you educate the same man, he'll steal the railway. And that really is something to ponder on. <laughs> Unregenerate, sinful man is more dangerous when he's educated than when he's uneducated. He can do more harm. So the Bible is not talking about education when it talks about understanding. When I was in East Africa, in Kenya, I was in educational work. And uh, at that time, the African people were just emerging into, out of the Stone Age, into the Jet Age, really, in one generation. And uh, they'd come to the place where they saw the white man had the edge over them. The white man could do things the black man couldn't do. And they had come to the conclusion they wanted to be able to do it themselves. They didn't want white men there running their railways and their government and all these things. They felt we should be able to do it. And grasping out, they thought to themselves, what does the white man have that we don't have that enables him to do what we don't do? And their answer was education. So education really became their god. Now I was in the field of education, training teachers, and... Uh, I used to tease them. I used to say, you Africans, you've thrown away your gods of wood and stone because you found they didn't work. And you've got a new god. And they would look at me and I'd say, shall I tell you his name? And they'd say, please. And I'd say in Swahili, Elimu, which is the Swahili for education. And uh, I saw that to reach them, I had to break this hold of the God of education over their minds. And this is true of many other areas besides Africa. So I wrote a little pamphlet, which I still have somewhere, called, You Are Striving After Education, But Are You Also Finding Wisdom? And I pointed out this simple truth, that it's possible to be highly educated and very foolish. 
And I think most countries in the world need to realize this fact. Education does not automatically solve your problem. There's a difference between education and understanding. And understanding is in the realm of the spirit, man's spirit, illuminated by God's spirit. Coming back to Job 32.8, there is a spirit in man, and the inbreathed breath of the Almighty, the spirit of God breathed into the spirit of man, brings forth understanding. Looking down a little further to verses 18 and 19, now these are the words of Elihu. And Elihu was one of the men who turned up to be present at Job's tragic situation. He wasn't one of the three comforters. And he sat there, a rather younger man, and listened to these older men talking until he just couldn't keep quiet any longer. So in chapter 32, Elihu bursts into speech. And this is what he says in verses 18 and 19. I'll read the King James and then give you more literal translation. For I am full of matter. The spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. But more literally, and if you have a marginal version, you'll see this. He said, I'm full of words, and the spirit of my belly is urging me, pressing me. So that tells you very clearly where the spirit is. It's in the belly. And what he's saying is, I'm so pressed in my spirit, I'm like a, a wineskin that's got wine in it with no outlet. I've got the birth. I must speak. I'm full of words. The spirit of my belly must have expression. So we're told again there where the spirit is. It's in the belly. There is a spirit in man and it's in his belly. And there comes a time when that spirit just must express itself. And it expresses itself in words. Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. When you read the word heart in scripture, do not think of the physical organ that pumps blood through the body. Think of the area that we're talking about, the belly, because that's what is denoted most times by the word heart in scripture. All right, let's look at one other scripture about the location of the spirit. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1, just the first verse. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. God's message for Israel. Seth the Lord, and then we're told three things about the Lord. Who stretcheth forth the heavens, layeth the foundations of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. There are three mighty acts of God stretching out the heaven, laying the foundation of the earth, and forming man's spirit in his midst. Again, it's the same word. Uh, the same word is used in the twelfth chapter of Isaiah where it says, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. It's in the midst. It's in this middle area, this hollow place this special area set apart for something special. In that area, God forms the spirit of man. The word form is the same word that we found used of the clay in Genesis 2-7. The careful fashioning of something that requires tremendous skill. So, it's a very wonderful thought. God skillfully fashioned the human body but more skillfully yet, he fashions and forms and shapes the spirit within the body. And much of what God is doing in your life is done to form your spirit within you the way he wants it done. And with the Holy Spirit, who is the finger of God, he molds your spirit within you. So. Those are the scriptures that tell us so clearly the location of the spirit in man. 
Now let's look for a moment at the location of the soul. And the scripture that tells us this most clearly is in Leviticus 17, 11. Now I'm going to make this statement, and I know it's true, because it's in the scripture. If there are things about it that I do not understand, that doesn't worry me. So you could ask me questions about this that I might not be able to answer. That doesn't embarrass me the least bit. But what I do know, I'll tell you. I think it's uh, a basic Baptist principle. Don't preach opinions, preach facts. And that's a very sound one, too. Uh, Leviticus 17.11. All right. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. But now here's where you must get behind the translation. Because the word life is nefesh, which means, come on you Hebrew scholars now, soul, that's right. What the Bible says is the soul of the flesh is in the blood. Now there are many, many other passages in the Mosaic law that make the same statement. So if you want to know where your soul is located within your physical body while you live, it's in the blood. Let's have go on looking, because this, this is a tremendously prophetical verse. For I have given it to you, the blood, upon the altar, to make an atonement for your souls. Notice, it's the same word soul there that's translated life at the beginning of the verse. You see, it's a soul for a soul. It's the soul that's the substitute for the soul. Do you follow what I mean? It's a life for a life. A soul for a soul. This is the whole principle of the law. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a soul for a soul. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. If you translate soul all through that verse, it's much more clear in its meaning than if you use the word life at the beginning. Let me, let me do it that way. For the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you, the blood and the soul in it upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now that is not merely a statement of Mosaic law. It's a prophecy of Calvary. For on the altar of the cross, the same Lord that was speaking there gave his own soul through his blood to make an atonement for the souls of the human race. Now if you turn to Isaiah 53, and verse 12, which is the climax of the great prophecy of the atonement, you'll find the parallel truth. I, I must assume that you realize that Isaiah 53 is the great Old Testament prophecy, detail by detail, scene by scene, of the atonement of Jesus on the cross. And it's summed up in verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. When did Jesus pour out his soul unto death? When he poured out his lifeblood unto death. The, the blood, the, the soul is in the blood. And Jesus gave his divine eternal soul a substitute, an atonement, for the souls of all men. And he gave it when he poured out his blood on the cross. When you want to unite those two verses, study them for yourself. Leviticus 17.11, Isaiah 53.12. They are perfectly correspond, the one to the other. Now, there are things that I don't understand and that doesn't bother me. Uh, I, I don't think I'm alone. I think there are some other people that don't understand everything too. But let me point out to you, and remember now you're looking at a medical orderly class two of the British Army. So I'm almost a quote expert. Uh, there's a strange relationship within the body between the breath and the blood. The main organ that handles the breath is the lungs. Isn't that right? The main organ that handles the blood is the heart. As you know, I'm sure many of you do, your heart is pumped, your blood is pumped out of your heart, down the left side, through the arteries, down to the extremities, 
turns around and comes back through the vein. And when it goes out, it's fresh red, and when it comes back, it's a dark bluish color because it is laden with impurities. But every time it comes back, passing through the lungs, by the oxygen in the lungs, it is purified and becomes bright red again. So the breath in the lungs is, let me say, the counterpart of the spirit. The life is in the blood. When do you stop living? Two things happen. You stop breathing and your blood ceases to circulate, coagulate. A life element has gone. But I think what God's little parable is telling us is this, that it's the spirit that purifies the soul. And if the soul isn't in contact with the spirit, there's nothing to purify, you see. It's the oxygen in the lungs that purifies the blood, keeps the body functioning. And I have no question in my mind that God planned this as a parable of spiritual truth. All right, now I'm going to take a look at the condition of man before and after regeneration. If you don't know what regeneration means, it means rebirth, being born again. First of all, look, let's look at man as he is in his lost, sinful condition, alienated from God through sin. Uh, Ephesians 2, 1. Paul is speaking to believers in Christ. He says, You have God made alive. That's supplied by the translators. It isn't important for the time being. You who were dead in trespasses and sin. Notice, these people were not physically dead. They were alive. But they were dead spiritually. Their spirit was dead. Their soul went on functioning. Their body went on functioning. Their spirit was dead. Spiritually dead, cut off. And in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, the 18th verse, this is again stated even more clearly. We must read verse 17 to get the whole picture. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. This is how the nations of the world walk who are not illuminated by the word of God. In the vanity or the emptiness or the frustration of their mind, having the understanding darkened. Notice where the realm of understanding is. It's in the realm of the spirit, you see. When the spirit is cut off, it's dark. The understanding is darkened being alienated, cut off from the life of God. Not in the soul, not in the body, but in the spirit. The contact between man's spirit and God's spirit has been severed by sin. Man is cut off from the life. He's in darkness and he's blind because of the blindness of the heart. Spiritually he is blind. He cannot see. He's in the dark. He is dead. That's the condition of unregenerate humanity. Very, very important to understand. There are many people today, many cults, many cases, this is the teaching of unity, that do not emphasize the lost condition of unregenerate man. Man is lost. He's dead. He's cut off. He's in the dark. He's blind. And all his intellectuality and religion and reasoning cannot change that condition. It must be done by sovereign, creative intervention of Almighty God. There is nothing else that meets man's need. Uh, look at what cut man off. And this is a very important scripture. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 spoken to the most religious people on earth, the Jewish people, who had a religion given them by divine revelation of whom came the prophet. 
But this is what their own prophet says to them. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. What separates between God and man? Only one thing, sin. And sin invariably separates. Most important to see that. If you want to look at the moment of spiritual death, turn to Genesis again. Genesis 2, 17. When God created man with free will and placed him in the garden, there had to be an opportunity for man to exercise his will either for or against God. Otherwise, free will would have been a mockery. You know, many of us bring our children up like that. We say, you can do what you please, but you've got to do what I tell you. And your child grows up inwardly a rebel. Don't be ignorant about that fact. And one day, about the age of 16 or 17, is going to burst the bonds and break loose, kick up its heels, and start making some decisions. And never having been given the privilege of making decisions, it's going to make some very foolish ones. Every parent is obligated to start very young training his child to make his own decisions. And let them be valid decisions. Let your child do something wrong every now and then, if that's necessary. But don't do it all for him, because that's what he resents more than anything else. We are bringing up, she isn't here today, a little African girl. And of course, being a black girl brought up by white people, there are obviously problems ahead. Well, my wife and I say that the Lord's problem is not ours. The Lord gave her to us. But we deliberately encourage her to make her own decisions. Because someday she's going to have to make very difficult decisions. And it isn't fair to plunge a child at the age of 16 suddenly into the decision-making process without any preliminary training. But many parents are doing that. They make all the decisions, they set all the rules, there's very little communication, there's not much real valid discussion. It's just do it because I say so and the church says so and that's what people do. Believe me, my dear friend, what you are doing is training a rebel. And one day you'll be astonished at the sudden outburst of rebellion. God didn't do that. God said to Adam, you're here, you're in charge. <laughs> Isn't that remarkable? You dress the garden, you keep it, you look after it, you name the animal. And he said, you've got two choices. Of all the trees in the garden, you can freely eat. There's one tree in the middle of the garden that you must not eat of. You can, but I want to tell you what will happen when you do. Let's read these words. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of one. Now you just think about human nature. You go out and leave your children at home and say, You can open every drawer in my desk except the bottom one. Which is the drawer they're going to go for? <laughs> the bottom one, isn't it? That's one sure way <laughs> to get human beings to do something is to tell them not to. We've got a little poodle at home named Sammy, and he's a character. At night, when we want Sammy in the bedroom, he won't come in. So I used to stand there and call him, and he would sit outside and look at me. I don't do that anymore. I go inside and close the door. One minute later, he's scratching at the door to get in. <laughs> Sometimes God has to deal with you and me that way. I think that's true about prayer groups, you know. Don't invite the world in. Tell them to stay out. <laughs> that's the way to get them in. <laughs> when you've, there's a little book somewhere that's called When You've Tried Inviting All the Neighbors, Then Seek God. <laughs> I believe myself, I'm getting distracted from my thing, but I believe a home prayer group should be my invitation. That's the difference between a home and a public assembly. Make it a little difficult to get in. Don't let everybody come waltzing in. 
You have quite a different kind of home prayer group, believe me. All right, we're going back to Genesis 2, 16, 79. Every tree of the garden thou must freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereon, thou shalt surely die. When will you die? Which day? The day you eat. Adam ate. Did he die physically? Not for many, many years. But he died spiritually. Because his rebellion separated him instantly from God. From then on, he was dead in trespasses and sin. He was a rebel by nature. And every descendant of Adam is born with a rebellious nature. We won't go into that. Let me point out one other very interesting fact that doesn't directly relate to our study. Who told Eve that she was not to eat of the tree? Well, I believe somebody did. It wasn't the Lord. It was Adam. You see what I'm at? God said to Adam in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt die. He was only speaking to one person. But Eve said, we may eat of every tree except. Who told Eve? Adam. That's a very far-reaching principle too. Whose responsibility is it to give spiritual instruction to the wife, the husband? Where do most wives get their spiritual instruction today? Shall I tell you? Brother Prince's tapes. <laughs> and I don't know the way around it, but there must be a way. It isn't right. What's the situation in America today? Wives getting more and more spiritual and husbands dropping further and further behind. <laughs> I went to one home. It embarrassed me. The wife said, I want you to meet my husband. And he said, you know, I sit by the hour and listen to you, your tapes. <laughs> I wished I'd never been there. This poor wife was making this man listen to my tapes by the hour. He certainly wasn't a candidate for my ministry, I'll tell you that. But there's a very, very far-reaching truth. The wife should get her spiritual instruction from her husband. You say, that's only the Old Testament. Oh, no, friend, it isn't. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which is the gift chapter for all you charismatic, if the wife wants to know anything, what is she to do? Ask her husband at home. Now, I can see you all telling me right now with your eyes, but my husband doesn't know. <laughs> Shall I tell you what to do? Keep asking. Put the pressure on. <laughs> Say it's your responsibility. Come on, I want to know. I tell wives this. Don't get in front of your husbands and pull them in. Get behind and push them. Now, that's gang, by the way, but as I say, there's no extra charge for that. Notice then what happened when man disobeyed God. He died spiritually that instant. Because sin separates from God. He didn't die in his soulish realm. He didn't die in his physical realm. But he was spiritually dead. And that's the condition of the human race. Alienated from God. Cut off. In the dark. Ignorant blind, without feeling, without response. I think I should give you another scripture for that because it's very important to see it. There's a lot of people in the charismatic movement trying to bypass this issue. If you turn to Psalm 14, and if you can't find Psalm 14, you can turn to Psalm 53 because the first three verses of each psalm are the same. Psalm 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. Here is God's picture of unregenerate humanity. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt, 
They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men. In Hebrew, the sons of Adam. This is the entire Adamic race. To see if there were any that did understand. Notice the word understand. Spiritual. And seek God. Now what's the record? They are all gone aside. They are all become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Notice there's not one descendant of Adam that naturally will understand and seek God. For many years I deceived myself after I was saved. I said I know I was a sinner, but at least there was one good thing about me. I was seeking God. And one day I read that scripture and the Lord said very clearly to me, don't deceive yourself any longer. You weren't interested in seeking me the least bit until I began to move upon you by my spirit. It started with me and not with you. And any impulse to do good or seek God in man originates with God and not with man. There is the condition of the human race Apart from the grace of God and the moving of the Spirit of God, they do not understand, they do not seek God, they are all become filthy, there is none that doeth good. And we must hold on to this truth, because otherwise we're going to depart from the whole truth of the gospel. The gospel depends upon the need of man for its validity. And man in his religious pride and stubbornness is always trying to evade the issue of being totally dependent on God's grace. Now let's look and see what happens at regeneration. The rebirth. Clearly from what I've said to you, I believe it's obvious that it's the spirit that is regenerated, born again made alive. Let's look in John chapter 3, that famous conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And we won't read all of it, just verses 3 through 6. John 3, 3 through 6. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, the Greek word from above, meaning either from above literally or a totally new start. Uh, Luke uses the word in the introduction to his gospel when he says he's had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first. It's the same word that you, Luke uses. It means a totally new beginning and a beginning that originates from God. Because you see the spirit of God always comes into man from above. Except a man be born again from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice. He cannot see because he is spiritually blind. He's in the dark. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the rebirth is the rebirth of the Spirit. The physical body was born out of the physical body, but the spirit of man is reborn by the Spirit of God from above. Ephesians 2, 5, we get the other aspect of this transaction, life in place of death. We have to read verse 4 to get the full sentence. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. God loved us even when we were dead. Hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. We were dead, but we are now alive. We have been made alive by the Spirit of God. It's regeneration. It's being made alive. The great picture of this in the parable, of course, is the prodigal son who left home turned his back on the father broke and severed his ties went as far and as low as he could 
ended up amongst the swine and then repented, made a decision, said, I will arise and go to my father, turned round and started on the road back. And you know, of course, the story. He was determined to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am not worthy to be called thy son. But his father was waiting for him, ran and met him, fell on his neck and kissed him and never let him say, I am not worthy to be called thy son. He let him confess his sin and stopped him there and brought out the best robe, put shoes on his feet, a ring on his finger, killed the fatted calf, and said, let us make merry. For this my son was lost and is found, was dead and is alive. That's rebirth. That's regeneration. That's coming back to the Father. That's making contact again with God. You were lost and in the dark. You didn't even know where you were going. You couldn't see your way. Now you're found. You were dead, and now you're alive. And bless God, that old religious elder brother found himself on the outside looking in. And there they were. There was music, and dancing, feasting, and the elder brother wasn't even part of it. And you, <laughs> I love, God forgive me, but so many Pentecostals are like that today. Oh dear. <laughs> The Charismatics are coming in, the Catholics, the Baptists, and all the rest of them, making merry and dancing. And some people that said we had it all find themselves on the outside looking in. A lot of sermons are preached on the prodigal son. Somebody should preach on the elder brother. You know. He had it all, but he wasn't living in it. His father said, all that I have is thine but you're living like a beggar instead of like a son. You know, there's one phrase in that parable that I like. It says, they began to be merry. And I like to put that together with Acts 2, 4. They began to speak with other tongues. If you want to speak with other tongues, you've got to begin. Do you know that? We had a lady here three nights ago, Sunday night, she just wouldn't begin, that's all. <laughs> she was bubbling, fluttering, sobbing, but she wouldn't begin to speak. And if you don't begin to speak, you won't speak. That's all there is. You've got to begin. And lots of people say, well, Brother Prince, I'd like to be free in the spirit. I'd like to dance. I'd like to enjoy myself. You know what you've got to do? You've got to begin. <laughs> you've just got to begin. Some people know that I sometimes indulge myself in a little dancing. Some people are surprised, but I do it. I do it, you know why I do it? Because I begin to do it. Other people sit there and say, I wish I could do it. You'll never do it unless you begin. There is such a thing as beginning. I don't feel super spiritual when I begin, I just begin. And if you want to be merry, Sometime in your life you have to begin. Turn loose. Forget the tradition. Say, they don't do it in my church. Well, that's what somebody said. That's why we're not in your church. So it's all right for you to begin. The nature of the regenerated spirit. You know what I think? I think we better stop there. Second thought, because this is a completely new and a tremendous theme. Now you'll get a great deal more out of tomorrow's study if between now and then you read through these scriptures that are outlined here.